three pages of introductions. <laughs> so I'm going to get through it really fast. Uh, welcome to the 21st uh, Easter of Ever Lecture Series. And uh, before we get into it, I'd like to, you to introduce to two new people here. Uh, one is uh, Eric Augustine. She is our new advisor. Uh, yeah. She started on Monday, so be gentle with her. Yeah. <laughs> Give her time until she gets up to uh, speed. And the other person is uh, uh, Dr. Baker's daughter. And uh, some of you may have remembered Dr. Baker, who was the uh, previous program director uh, for about 20 years, back at USIU and also at Ohio. And uh, after his premature death three years ago, uh, the family established the scholarship funds for, uh, for uh, Ohio students. And I think the best recipient is Justin. Would you stand up, please? So, so this uh, scholarship is for outstanding students and, and who carries on uh, Dr. Baker's uh, uh, legacy. And uh, well, Carissa is, is uh, taking uh, uh, donations and also uh, has applications, you know, so if you want to apply for scholarships and so on. So, uh, you could see her uh, either during the lecture or after the lecture, and, and, and so on. So, thank so thank you, Carissa. All right. Uh, then, Isabella, Christina Isabella, who started this lecture series, uh, usually sends out a letter every year. Not usually, she sends out a letter every year. And, and so I'm, I'm going to read the letter for you. He says, uh, I warmly uh, greet John Cantor, that's me. <laughs> uh, and then there's co-sponsor is Margaret Coburn, Margaret, and, and Bob Koenig uh, from Simla Group. And they've been sponsoring this event for the last 20 years. And, and finally we got Bob as a, as a speaker after 20 years. You know, he's been sponsoring the event. And uh, uh, so we, we, we're very grateful for them to come. And Bob uh, has done research on Simlog since 1970. And, uh, and he was a, a postdoc fellow at Harvard University after he got his PhD. And he worked with uh, Bears, Robert P. Bears. And he worked with him on their Bears dad in 2004 and, and developed the Simlog instrument. And he's the first one who made it commercially available. And matter of fact, if you are interested in, in the use of the instrument, uh, there is a flyer out there. So on the way out, you can pick, pick it up. And I, I just I just done the instrument uh, myself. And, and I tell you, I, I want it to look good, you know, because I know Bob and Margaret, you know. <laughs> and and it, it really gave a good picture of myself. You know, now you, you need to be honest, because what, what you get is what you put in, you know. So, so and it's, it's good for developmental purposes, you know, where you are as a leader compared to the ideal leader, and so on. And it, it's amazing, you know, that the things it's picked up that I, uh, I didn't think about myself in that way. And, but then thinking back, you know, and I said, wow, you know, this is great. So anyway, so, so Bob commercialized it and then constantly developing that instrument. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going away from the letter, but basically this is, this is what the letter is saying, that, that what a great person Bob is, and he's been working, uh, <laughs> working, uh, uh, in, in five continents, you know, South and North America, Europe, Asia, and uh, Australia, and Africa. Uh, they, they haven't done the Arctic, or the Antarctica. Yeah, that's <laughs> And uh, they, uh, 
they uh, translated the instrument into 17 languages. So, so it's, it's pretty widely used. As a matter of fact, Christina done her dissertation comparing uh, leaders in the US and in Italy. And Christina is a coach now, uh, a leadership coach in Italy. And, and she says she's still using it after 20 years. You know? so, so it, it's, it's kind of an interesting instrument and 26 questions. And then Bob will tell you more about it. Uh, Bob got his uh, PhD at uh, St. Louis University, as, as I mentioned, you know, then he went to Harvard and worked with Bears. And, and he's been also teaching at Harvard, uh, Boston College, UCLA. And, and he was teaching at the uh, U.S. side periodically, but, uh, and then I think he's even at Hawaiian, but at the merger, the one time, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, too expensive for us. <laughs> we, we really appreciate, you know, what he can do for us, but uh, it's, it's very busy. And uh, uh, again, you know, he was the very first uh, professional to develop and, and constantly improving on and uh, and uh, I'd like you to welcome Bob Kirby. Pioneer of conflict resolution and cooperation, study of conflict. So, Deutsch goes on to say, and it cannot be said that field theory as a separate or specific psychological theory has much current vitality. This is in 1968. I'm here to talk to you about it in 2013. Bales was writing about it in 19. None of the grand theories of psychology is any longer much in vogue. All this is before you were born. <laughs> Nor can it be said that Lewins, anybody heard of Lewin? Ah, now we have a common touchstone. That Lewin's specific theoretical constructs, his structural and dynamic concepts, are central to research now being carried on in social psychology. So even Lewin had and faith, according to Morgan Deutsch, 1968. Then, here's a rather long paragraph, but stay with me, because it's about what we're about tonight. So Bales goes on in his article, The New Field Theory in Social Psychology, 
And he says, the judgment about specific constructs may be essentially correct, but the need for field theory as a basic perspective and integrated frame of reference in social psychology is far from dead, 1980. It is the recognition that any given psychological process or piece of overt behavior always takes place in a larger context of other psychological and behavioral processes. Now, who was the first one to state this? Was it Lewin? It was John Dewey, but he did that in 1896, so well over a century ago. The totality of the processes constitute an interactive gestalt in which the parts flow together and influence each other systematically in such a way that some conclusive, relatively simple pattern often emerges. Put another way, if you're observing behavior, it can seem random, it can seem chaotic, it can seem all over the place, but if you can know what to observe and how to observe it, you see patterns beginning to develop. <coughs> talking about those patterns tonight. Bales was on to say, there is a pervasive theoretical need to take this contextual interactive gestalt into account. I'm going to kind of ease up on these words in a minute. <laughs> Field theory and social psychology is an attempt to meet this need. And the last thing he says is, the need for field theory is not new, it is pervasive, and it will not go away. But the problem is not so much one of recognizing the need. The problem has always been, and still is, how to get a manageable handle on a complex global process. Like what? Let's say leadership. It is not possible to get out atomistic, one thing at a time approach without a theory of higher order relationships that can be comprehensively grasped and texted. Okay. Enough of this for tonight. <laughs> what does that mean? Can you just give me a clue? What, what did I just say? Frank would look at one single part may not provide you a full representation of the whole. When you start to pull things out and look at them just one little piece at a time. You can move the head of the class. <laughs> This is a donkey. <laughs> this is a 
donkey out of the field. What is this donkey going to do? Eat grass. Run around the field. Pardon me? Run around the field. Yes. Possibly. Roll around. Depends on what? If it's night or day, if there's food or not, if there's other donkey, if there's people, if there's beautiful. So often, thank you, when you're in a in a conversation with somebody, you'll say to them, well, what are you going to do? And they say, well, it depends. And you say, it depends on what? And they say, it depends on the situation. Well, what is the situation? It's such a simple word. We use it all the time. But the situation can change. For example, this donkey, we don't know what this donkey is going to do because we don't know what the situation is. But if I tell you that over here, is a bale of hay, and that this donkey is hungry, something just happened with some probabilities. So I'd say, well, what might this donkey do? And you might say, go toward the bale of hay. As it turns out, there's another bale of hay over here. Same bale. What is a donkey likely to do? Now you have bales of hay. Rubber bales. What's that donkey likely to do? It depends. Is there a bull? Ah, I'll tell you what there is over here. So we don't know. This donkey might just get stuck here. In fact, donkeys have been known to be equidistant from some water and some hay and not be able to make up their minds to starve to death. But over here, <laughs> you blame your acting bait to wish you could come here to butt down. <laughs> So the situation has changed. And in your head, these images come into the field and they change. And they change potentially the interaction. So we're now thinking maybe the donkey would go over toward this bale of hay. But as it turns out, the dog is a friend of the donkeys. <laughs> and he's yelling and howling because Not only that, he's trying to warn the donkey because he gets to the field and the donkey's watching all this happen. Into the donkey's perceptual field, he's perceiving the situation and he recognizes that the donkey is barking at this lion. I'm sorry. That's why I'm putting up the picture so I can keep it. <laughs> the 
dog and barking at the lion. Now, what might that donkey do? He could probably come and use some therapy. <laughs> anyway, what's this donkey going to do? <laughs> Just about the time he's trying to figure this out, <laughs> in comes the owner. Uh -huh. You see all right over there? Yeah. In comes the owner, and he is letting this donkey have it with a stick. What might the donkey do now? Well, the donkey might make a different decision. If he recognizes that there's a lady donkey. <laughs> Over here. So we've got a bale of hay, we've got a friendly dog, we've got a lady donkey, we've got a bale of hay over here that's in a fighter, a lion, an owner. But Maybe that the donkey isn't really interested. Instead, the donkey sees. Now what might the donkey do? Well, we don't know. And I assure you, after having lived a lifetime as a psychologist, I don't know. This is one of the most difficult fields, in my estimation, to be in because it is so theoretical and so abstract and people talk the way Bales wrote that article. So how do we get our mind around this thing so that it doesn't move <coughs> sitting in the back of the room for 20 years? I noticed that most of the, most of the people, because we invited them, came and they talked about leadership. So I wanted to have you do an exercise for me. We're going to ask you to use a survey, a form of research, and I want you to answer a survey question for me. So if you'll take out your hand up, I hope everybody has it. Should have four. Take the one that has this set of items on it. Okay. I want you to think about the most effective leader that you've ever known. I don't care where it was, what the situation was, just think about the most effective leader you've actually known. And answer this question. In general, what kinds of values are shown by the most effective leader of a task oriented team to have actually known? So take your magic writing instrument, start at the left, item number one, and draw an arrow. The longer the arrow, the more that effective leader showed that item. The shorter the arrow, the less that value was shown. So think of on the left side as never, the right side as always, and draw 26 arrows of different lengths to answer that survey question. Please. What kinds, of value, what kinds of values are shown by this most effective leader? This leader has behaved in the past. You've observed this behavior, and you've observed these values. 
try to draw 26 arrows that are your estimate of the answer to that survey question. Do this as quickly as you can, please. It's not a test. When you're finished, please turn to the person next to you and take a look. Even if you haven't finished, you have enough. We talked about patterns before. Just turn to the person on your left or your right and see if you see any kind of a pattern. observations, they tend to see the same pattern. Well, one of the things that uh, this helped me do was solve a puzzle that I was having for a long time, and which I didn't really find, quite honestly, as I sat in the back of the room for 20 years. And that was, I, I kept hearing and reading and digging as far into I, as I could into leadership and leadership development, but I couldn't find a definition of leadership that was measurable. And you may remember that was Bale's concern about Lewin. Lewin had this theory, but he didn't really have a method of measurement. Well, if you can't define something, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't give back feedback to help guide the development. So measurement is kind of central. So we use a system called the new field theory. One of the things it does, look at your handout. If you 
look at your hand up, you see these words that you use to describe effective and ineffective leaders? This list? This looks like a random set of words, doesn't it? What I'm here to inform you about is that this new field theory, it's like an engine. If you take it and you take the measurement system and you turn the crank, these words that seem so random turn out like this. In the field. So here, the words are all randomized. When you put the juice to the crank, that is, run it through the measurement system, the field sorts itself out, much like the one you're looking at. Follow me so far? <laughs> I meant if you take the theory and the measurement system that is associated with it and apply the data or apply the information to the measurement system, out comes something that looks like that. correlated with each other, go together. Those that are positively correlated, go together. Those that are negatively correlated are opposite. So you're really looking at the output of a correlation matrix. In this, in this case, uh, item to scale or trait to scale correlation matrix. Now, so what is this definition of leadership? why it's so important. Here's a working definition of leadership. And by working, I mean it, it is, it's a definition. You put it to work and you can test it out. And you can judge by the output whether or not it is um, workable. talking about effective leadership is the social interaction process. Remember back to the interaction piece? It's not a person, it's not a place, it's not a thing, it's not a job title, it's not a particular kind of trait. It's a process. So leadership is a social interaction process that unifies a diverse group of people. So the key verb there is unification. What's the opposite of unification? Is polarization. Unification, polarization. So how does this come about? It's a process that unifies a diverse group of people to work together for a common purpose. So the key there is on work. In a varied and often difficult circumstances. It can't just be when it's easy or you have enough budget or enough staff or enough resources. Through the elimination of scapegoating. You know what scapegoating is? It goes on in Washington all the time. One of the, their fault. Your fault. Anyway, the elimination of scapegoating. The maximization of mediation where our pioneer more Deutsch comes back in, mediating conflict, and the judicious use of power. You know, I can get a group to unify very quickly if I just take the hammer and bring it down. That's what happens in a lot of authoritarian organizations. So that's a working definition. I think the wrong one, sorry. Here is a field diagram of a highly, a highly polarized group. Now, how do I know it's highly polarized? Well, everybody rated everybody, much like you did. Ran it through the mathematics and located the image in the space. So we have Dan 
and Sam and Art and Tom and Pat and Paul, Pam and Bob, you know, and the barking dog and the bale of hay and the lion and the carrots in the field. And they're in all four quadrants. The theory indicates that a group of images and group of people are unified when they are within certain distances from each other using the mathematics. In this case, it's about nine, plus or minus nine. Anyway, they're in all four quadrants. <coughs> Here's a group potentially unified. It looks considerably different than the other one. They're both work groups. What do you notice about this group?
that there's a dynamic field of forces. The dynamic forces have a potential and tendency to unify and polarize within the field. Those things that go together tend to cluster together, and those that are apart tend to polarize. The potentials and tendencies exist because of the nature of competing values, or valences, as Lewin would call them, involved in any interaction. Now, that's kind of a cheap line there because of the nature of values. We could do a six week course on values, but let's just look at it for a minute. What is the nature of values? For every individual and organizational value, there's an opposite or conflicting value. When you went down that line with your pencil, some of the longer lines you drew very far out, some you didn't put very far out. It was the opposite of the ones that you were putting longer. So values tend to coalesce and unify with similar values and conflict and polarize, that is, Oh, there are two poles. For every value, there are two poles with opposing value positions. Why values? In this system, values are mental constructs of what is good and bad in this situation, as opposed to beliefs and attitudes and behaviors and whatnot. We're defining values as those mental constructs that define in the situation what is good and bad whether the barking dog is an enemy or a friend. Values may be expressed passively or moderately or with great passion and with righteous, righteous indignation. Other consideration. In this scheme, beliefs are neutral or are mental constructs of what is true or false. Beliefs can arouse and be expressed as strong convictions. But I posit to you that when people conflict, it's not around beliefs, it's around values. And that's the key. So that value, if you want to study interactive systems, values, values of the pipeline, the portal, to get inside the get or the system or whatever the interaction is. Attitudes are mental constructs of what the person, what the person is for or against in the situation. Attitudes orient dispositions toward the situation, but they don't create the conflict in the situation. That's the level of values. And behavior can be expressed as verbal or nonverbal, can be effective or ineffective for the situation. So we're going to focus on values. That's why the theoretical system purports that a person evaluates situation. It's always happening. That donkey is constantly evaluating. So are you. And it can happen in the smallest interaction. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? Oh, real well. What's happening with your day? Oh, not very much. It's all happening. It's all right there in the situation. This evaluation process. The system measures, values, or valences, or vectors associated with salient images that arouse tension within the mind. A salient image is one that you can keep in your head and focus on. So we're not doing the cabbage or a rutabagger or something else. The measurement system calculates and displays the resultant location of images and the field of forces activated in the mind and influencing the interaction. That is, when I said turn the crank earlier, when you apply the measurement system, it not only does the calculation, but it produces the resulting location. Sand is located here. The image of the relf is located over here. Bobby? Physiological reaction, primarily within the limbic system, that accompanies this evaluative system, and it creates tensions. So, I guess I'm having trouble. 
I say to you, uh, it's probably too far. If I say to you, uh, Adolf Hitler, something happens in your mind. You get an image. Certain things begin to happen with that image. There's certain inferences, certain evaluations about that. It may be more or less positive because it's perceived as good. It may be more or less negative. Those processes go on and they go on naturally. That's what the theory posits. Okay, so then how does that connect to this? What is the this? So what you just have to, what you refer to. Oh, what you because I asked you, you get this image in your mind of this most effective leader that you've known. So you have the image in your mind. Then I present you with the measurement system. And you read the first set of items, the first item. And you're, you're reading that, and that creates an image in your mind. And you compare that image in your mind with the other image in your mind. And if they don't line up at all, you probably wrote, you probably made a short arrow, rarely. If you said, boom, yep, that's Joe, that's who I was, you put a longer arrow. So they had greater valence, a greater strength of the force. And it was that pattern as you went down reviewing the items, while you kept the one image in your mind, that's what we're trying to measure. Okay, and then look at the interaction part. Well, if I'm looking at the barking dog and I'm evaluating and the dog is barking, I'm less inclined to go over there until I realize, hey, that's my dog. <laughs> He's barking. So it changes the whole evaluative set. And it goes from bad to good. Okay. So is there a behavioral component that we haven't done? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the one that's on the handout over there to try out. It's a brand new instrument. Okay. It's based on behavior rather than values. So you could say to me, Bob, how come you're up here pushing values just to behavior instrument? They're highly related. Let me see how we're doing on time. I could talk about this stuff all night, but I don't think we have time. I'm looking at 6.49. We want to have time for questions. Are we good for another 10 minutes? It's a long time to sit. Evaluating an individual, a group, a team, 
environment. It's the same process, fortunately. Uh, you go to some firms who are doing consulting and they've got four instruments for individual, six for teams, seven for organization, six for organizational climate, five for organizational culture, a couple for cross group, just kind of all kinds of instruments with very little integration. So what you can do is you can evaluate the current situation in the future by asking people survey questions to do that. I'll show you some examples. So this is data from over 60 countries that we've picked up in these 17 languages that we've used on. The random samples that I'm about to show you were drawn from a very large data. Participants use Simlog to answer survey questions just like you did. What kind of values does the most effective leader you've actually known show in behavior? Boom, 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 get your answer. Another way to do it, here's the question I asked them. Or you could ask them, in general, what kinds of values does your team currently show? See how you jump levels? Same survey, same items. See what some results are. These are the descriptive items, they don't change. So if I'm asking you about Ralph, I use these items. If I ask you about your organization culture, I use these items. If I ask about your uh, father, I use these items. People mark their using the measurement system, they mark rarely, sometimes, and often. I'm going to go quickly through this because you don't need to memorize any of this. Just know that it exists. If you do a large enough sample, 10, 20, 40, 70, 300, you'll get an average. And here are your three peaks and three valleys. And three valleys. That's why I was able to kind of predict that earlier. This is an answer to that question. In general, what kinds of values is the most effective leader you've actually known showing the behavior? You look down at your paper, you will find that you've had something like this if you made it through the whole exercise. But believe me, not everybody has the same leader in mind and they don't evaluate in the same way. This is the average. So these are the averages. <coughs> it's possible to plot these on the field diagram. And if you want to use this for giving feedback, there's an, an effective range here. That is, if the average is somewhere within this range, which is very liberal, by the way, you can let people know the feedback is, you're in, in the estimation of the observers, you tend to overemphasize this value, or you tend to underemphasize this value. For example, protecting less evil members, providing help when needed. Some people, really place a lot of emphasis on that, and it affects the way they interact with the work team. Other people put very high emphasis on active reinforcement of authority, rules, regulations. <coughs> they place a different emphasis and interact differently with the work team, and they're likely to conflict. <coughs> so if you take this most effective location from the research. You're just taking my word for it tonight. It lands in a very specific spot in the field diagram. Empirically, it lands precisely on the 45 degree angle and in the middle of what we call the inner circle. So the feedback norm that we use to provide feedback for effective leadership is based on the location of this image in the field. This image is the one, according to us, that has the greatest potential for unifying the diverse value positions in the group. Not something way over here on this side or somewhere I can locate it, but right there in the center of the reference. These 
three dimensions that we're measuring, I think you'll recognize kind of intuitively the three bipolar dimensions in this system. The first one has to do with individualistic versus group-oriented values. You know anybody that's highly individualistic? How do they tend to get along in a group? Pardon? Very poorly. Very poorly. Tend to be perceived as selfish and self-centered and in it for their self and whatnot. So we measure that dimension. The second one is accepting versus opposing established authority. I'm certain you've been around people that just, they just cannot go with the flow. If it has anything to do with authority, authority is constantly rebelling against it or pushing against it. And that, that rebelliousness may be in a negative way or it could be in a positive way, but it's opposition in any case. And values on dominance, and values on submissiveness. So you will see some big circles, dominant images, and some small circles, submissive images. What do I mean by that? So in the field, remember our field diagram on the board over here? We have a field with unfriendly on one side and friendly on the other. Accepting authority and opposing authority. You can look at those words if you want, the ones that are in there. Organized fashion. Values on dominance and values on submissiveness. And we do that since it's a three-dimensional model by using different size circles. Little tiny circle is little submissive image. Big circle is very dominant image. Probably the lion circle, where they put the picture up, would have been a big circle. Uh, just a quick question. Why? It's friendly and unfriendly. Why do you have M and P and then F and D for the authority? Well, we got the. Um, that one is a difficult question to answer. Give you the answer, but I don't have time to explain it. It's really a spatial model. So it's not evaluated. Upward and downward. That's the three dimensional. The big words on the paper, upward in the space, or downward in the space. Or forward. You're looking forward? That's the forward part of the room. That's the back part of the room. So images that are back there are B. Images that are Forward are F. And the PN, uh, uh, we had to put in as a positive and negative because the damn politicians already grabbed left and right. Screws <laughs> <laughs> up. Okay. So let's look at some, I'm going to go through this very quickly. There's a measurement system. It's the upper right quadrant, now that you know the lingo, the P, F quadrant, is the most effective, we call it the most effective teamwork core. It's opposed by the radical opposition core. In between, Is known as the right wing 
and the left wing in the political spectrum. So you have in the political spectrum the centrist position. You have the liberal side, where do you think Obama landed when we did his image? It wasn't on the authority center wing. It was over here. John McCain landed over here. Where would Graham Paul? Not Graham Paul, which one of them was Paul? Ron Paul. Not the Ron Paul. He's the dead. The other one. John Paul. John Paul, that's my son. <laughs> the younger one. Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan. There's more to the map. Mort Deutsch would love this. He's still working, but he's not quite using it yet. Um, <coughs> so that this political spectrum that we use, and it's so simple, we say, well, the left or the right, or the far left or the far right, it's not actually a spectrum, it's a circle. It goes all the way around. And not only does it go all the way around, it goes forward, it goes backwards. So there's a lot of space in this space for diversity whole bunch of diversity. But you can see, if you take these value positions, that they are likely to conflict with other value positions. For example, the radical opposition core and the group centered wing. The radical opposition core might be the, oh, let's say, Mr. Briggs, the Hells Angels. They could, could conflict with the group center wing, which might be, say, a group of jazz musicians that are kind of laid back, but they're friendly enough, they just have kind of dropped out of society. Wait a second. Wait a second. some other groups that might fit in these various parts of the space. But the branch the videos and the FBI at Waco. theology in South America of the magisterium of the church. So there are these tensions and these polarizations. And you can locate whatever these conflicts are, you can locate them in this space if you have access to the values that are operating in the interaction. That's the summary of the talk. Can you type that for a second? Simultaneous evaluative process. So we're working with human beings, so they're the ones that I'm trying to get inside their head to find out how are they evaluating the situation. So I ask them, I don't ask them about beliefs or attitudes or behavior. Anyway, I ask them about values. Because values are what people express righteous indignation about. That's where they get upset. Values. Don't cross me on my values, because I'll fight for them. That's what I mean, that's why we use values. So which are the, the values of what? The values of the other person? That I observe being in the situation. If my microscope is on you and Joe, 
that will that will be the option to do. If I ask about your team, you will think about your team, not each member one at a time, but your team and the interaction or the culture of your organization. I could have you, no time at all, since I don't have any left, uh, make a set of ratings on the culture of the Lions University, or CPS. What kind of values are actually shown in the administration for its students? And we can get that, we can pull it out, we can plot it, we can display it. I'm going to ask you where you think it is. I think it's wonderful. Invite me here to talk. Okay, let's see what I, we'll do this very quickly. If we ask people the values they wish to show, that's the scatter plot. So it's all over the map, all, not really, it's up in the right hand quadrant. Some much more conservative, such, some much more liberal, some much more idealized, but generally up in the reference circle. If you look at the bar graph of the wish image, you get the three peaks and the three valleys. Oh. So most everybody wants to be effective. They're not social deviants. You can ask people about the most effective member that they've actually known. I ask you about leader. Or I can ask you about the future team. Or I could ask you about the future culture, multiple levels. If I did that, Here's what we could expect. The wish image shows up here. That's the fantasy. That's the id that Freud was talking about. The wish, most effective member, future team, future culture, called a cluster, unified. The images are unified. People don't walk around in their head feeling all conflicted about these images. But they do feel conflicted about other images. We ask people about the values they tend to reject, either in themselves or each other, down in that lower left quadrant. A lot of diversity in these three people. Probably didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Well, they were people from the opposition. That's quite possible. Seriously.
try promoting these kind of values because of the in opposition to people's motivation. Future perfected team, current team, most effective leader, that's what you did. Least effective member, values rewarded by the organization. Well, isn't it something? The current culture and the current teams look a lot like the values that are rewarded in the organization. That would be a good place to start if you're an organization with a developer. Okay. What's the takeaway from this? I think it is the need for field theory is not new, it's pervasive and will not go away. Bale said that about 20 years ago, I was sitting back there and I thought it was good to come back and revisit. Field theory is required, in my mind, it's required for the study and development of dynamical social interaction systems. You can't get there with, with uh, arithmetic, you need a kind of calculus. Fortunately, the new field theory in social psychiatry and psychology is now approaching 45 years old, still alive, still hard at work. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>
in your mind? One, one fairly recent that we probably all can relate to is Margaret Thatcher in her death. Because she was loved in Falkland and she was despised in Argentina. They were happy to see her dead and all these have created Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the influence of one to the other and the consequences. Well, you haven't asked me about male and female and all those kind of breakdowns, which you can do. I'll give you one little view. That if I put up the data on <coughs> values would be ideal to be shown um, as rated by a female, and contrast that values to be shown by an effective leader by a male, which is which. Or if I ask the co-workers of the females what kind of values would be ideal for this person to show in order to be most effective in your work. If I do that with males, it's the same. Why? Because they're all dealing with the same conflicts. They're all dealing with the same potential polarization. And those polarizations will be present in the situation. They can't avoid the diversity. The interaction gives rise to these value conflicts. So if you, if you took uh, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, them, put them in a room. It's not just going to be lovey-dovey. They're not all going to agree on the goals. They're not all going to agree on how to get there. So there's going to be conflict. They do share some common values, and it may be how are we going to work together. So what you're looking for is common values around how we're going to work together. Collaboration on the one hand, diversity of values on what is it we're going to do with how do we do it, how do we innovate, how do we create, how do we meet the payroll, you know, all those questions. <coughs> Anybody else? So we're yes, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you. Please. Is there a gender difference in where they tend to cluster in, in reality as opposed to what, where they wish to be? Uh, yeah. As far as quadrant goes? There's a tendency, if you look at all the co-worker rates, say you have 100 people go to a leadership program. And uh, 100 people over in this program are women, and 100 people over here are men. And you get their co-workers to rate them, and you plot, you make a scatter plot of all of them. You'll see a kind of liberal bent in the women. And you'll see a kind of hard, I keep wanting to say hard ass, but I think it's hard hitting in the other one. But not you know, dramatically. There's much more common, commonality and common overlap. Well, after you um, assess a group, a team, uh, or organization, what's, what's the so what question? So now we know what our values are, we know where we are, we know where polar opposites. Got something we need to do. How do you then go in and assist this organization? Because values are being seen. I might never even known that I had these values. But now someone wants me to move to the left or the right. It's like, oh my goodness, that's great. Yeah, uh, that would be unrealistic to expect that. But to answer your question, how do you do it? That's uh, something called process, approach, plan, change. So it's a process that you enter into with an individual or a group or an organization over time using data to drive the decisions that they make about what kinds of things they will or will not try to change. And it's not a matter of changing quadrants, believe me, that It might be a matter of changing some habits 
things that you do not thinking, being able to make adjustments, being able to go out of your way, feeling less misunderstood because you're working things out with people. All those conflict resolution things come to play when you're trying to get a group to work better together. Whether it's a marriage or it's a family. So it's the reason you're going to school, I would imagine. I know how you said This just provides you with data. I, I would suggest, too, just insert one word. It isn't the values that you ever change. Because you're disagreeing with those values in most respects. If you look up at those, that circle that says wish, and you remember this pattern was, was very tightly clustered. We all, for self-preservation and effectiveness, hold an image. These come from others. So one of the questions is, what am I doing to create that image? Because it is not the one that is mine. So you don't change the values at all. They remain stable. What you're trying to do is change the perception that other ones, others have. They evaluate your behavior differently. And therefore, just as just as when you're thinking, you know, Margaret Thatcher here or Margaret Thatcher there, the whole the whole system changes in your head. You're seeing more friendly behavior, so therefore this person maybe isn't as selfish as I once thought they were. Okay, so it's the perception that we need in this here, not not the actuality. That's very helpful, Margaret. And it comes back to what you've been asking about behavioral. Yeah, behavioral. Thanks for me. Next question. Please. Where did you want to ask the question? About So I'm wondering, um, this list of values, where, where does it come from? How did you decide that it fits, that these represent these particular uh, anchor points in this uh, system? And how does it compare to, how do you see it compared to other systems like uh, the Schwartz Value Survey or O'Keefe or other circumflex or other models of values, you know, that may be similar or different? Um, O'Keefe and uh, the other circumflex models are quite similar. They just, yeah. they get at these. Is individual and organizational values. So they're a particular type of value. Asparagus, where did they come from? When Bales was, it's very short, when Bales was originally working, he got 800 value statements from all kinds of sources, the Bible and <coughs> anyway, all kinds of value statements. What's a value statement? Stitching time saves time. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Penny savings, penny years. That's a value statement. Okay, so we got 800 of these, and um, <coughs> basically did a factor analysis. Which ones went with which ones? Had people sort them, sort them out. Got all these piles. Did the factor analysis. <coughs> came up with the three dimensions. The dominance was dominance and submissiveness was one set of value clusters that oppose. It is friendly, unfriendly, approachable, unapproachable. It's another, and this one about authority and those together. So we developed these, <coughs> and the reason he went down the value route was one day he was doing, I should have told you this first, he was in the laboratory and he was running a case study, and he had a one-way mirror built into the room here in the laboratory at Harvard. And he was sitting behind watching these people go through a case study. And it was a case study that he had written. And it was about an executive team that had to make a decision about keeping this person or firing them or developing them or whatever. And so there were five people in the role play. And the more they got into it, the more they got into it, he noticed this one person was getting more and more agitated until he stood up. The guy stood up in the group, this is a role playing group, and said, we must support authority. And Bale said, what the hell is going on here? I wrote the case. And this guy is really into it. And what he was doing was expressing his values within that group. And it was then that, that he made his decision to go the route of values and to do this great grand factor analysis. Basically, you've got three general categories of values, but like, are you familiar with Jonathan Hayes' recent work? Um, you know, he 
talks are completely with six or eight general sets of values. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea about what's really being intended to. So it's a, it's a slightly different system. So I'm just wondering, you know, sort of, you know, how do we, what if there's a whole other, two other, three other dimensions? What would that do to this framework?